Hi, this is Gene, and I've been asked a lot of questions about how drones are used against poaching. Uh, typically, this is done in South Africa, and it's typically used for rhino poaching. And there's a lot of other poaching going on and theft, but uh, this whole program did start with rhino poaching. And here's a depiction of one of the guys tossing one of the UAVs that we're using now, one of the bat hawks, into the air. And this usually has a bungee launcher, which helps uh, get it airborne. And this is in the African bush. And as you can see, it's a uh, it's fairly flat and open, um, really an improved runway, so you don't really want to use landing gear. So normally we use something that we toss into the air and uh, we skid it in for landing. There's usually no landing gear involved. Rhino poaching has increased for several years. In 2008, it really wasn't all that bad, but it's been increasing and increasing. As you can see, it's uh, up to over a 1,000 animals a year. And there really aren't that many animals left in the world, so it isn't going to be too long, and it, they're going to be an extinct population. And the problem is that, really, it's a waste of time and energy to be poaching these animals anyway. They kill them in a very horrific manner, and they cut off their horns, which is no different than fingernail material. Those horns on those animals are supposed to be some medicinal value that the Vietnamese want, and they'll pay over $2,000 an ounce, more than what gold is worth for this medicinal purpose, but it has absolutely no medical benefits whatsoever. So it's just crazy that they do this. But it's being done and there's no way to stop it really without putting boots on the ground and to augment those boots on the ground because there's limited resources, limited amounts of money and people that go out and do this is that you know you've got to have some kind of force multiplier and that's where dogs come in and that's where drones come in. Actually, elephant poaching is about a hundred times more prolific than rhino poaching. There's about a hundred times as many elephants as there are rhinos. However, the ivory that comes off these tusks is not nearly as expensive in the aftermarket. It's about $28 an ounce that the tusks are sold for, whereas the rhino horn is sold for $2,000 per ounce, more than gold. So it's kind of a crazy thing. So the, uh, the rhino horns, which are just basically worthless material, it's just a fingernail type of material. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just a total waste. Whereas with the elephant tusks, at least ivory, that was used for billiard balls. And so a lot of elephants lost their lives to make billiard balls over 100 years ago. But uh, now the ivory is carved very nicely. And the biggest customer and consumer of ivory is the Chinese population right now. So they're trying to be educated so that they do not buy ivory so that they will not then of course need to kill all these elephants to be able to get the ivory from them. But in the meantime of course we're doing anti-poaching techniques here as well. And here I've got a list of related videos. The first one is about uh, baby rhinos because of course, if they start killing the parents, then what do the babies do? They usually just get killed by hyenas or just die due to lack of nutrition and not having their parents around. So they're being cared for by special interest groups. And then there's the hows and whys behind rhino poaching, another YouTube video. And then uh, there's a lot of oil being stolen from oil pipelines, and this is done worldwide. Here's um, a, a video on the Mexican drug cartels and how they're moving from not only selling drugs, cocaine, and things like that, but also they're moving into then stealing oil and reselling it. The final video is on how drones are actually used to save elephants and rhinos. So you might watch those videos. It's interesting to see how drones are being used nowadays to get into a lot of activities where there's a lot of thievery, uh, poaching, things of that nature, and how we're able to get in there and do the surveillance using drones and being a force multiplier so that you can do more for less. Here is a map of South Africa and up in the right hand corner you can see that Kruger National Park uh, borders right on Mozambique. What happens typically is that a team of three people will come over from Mozambique, cut through the fence, and then 
go into Kruger National Park to do poaching. Uh, there is as many as 15 teams in Kruger National Park at any one time doing poaching. So of course trying to cover the 7,500 square miles that Kruger National Park is is quite a daunting task. So they need some kind of a force multiplier. So they, they do have a few different techniques. Uh, one of them is to use which can locate the within about 10 feet and that will locate any poaching activity. Uh, they have to get out to that spot and of course they have to have and then it has to be but that is uh, one method that they're using now. They also use dogs and dogs can sniff out the poachers in heavy underbrush and things of that nature so adding drones to the mix has definitely been helpful for them. In fact everywhere that the drones have been operating there has been absolutely no poaching anymore. There are cameras set up around the park that are activated by motion sensors and here we see a group of a couple of guys who have been picked up by one of these cameras. Uh, typically they're in groups of three. One person carries a large boar rifle for shooting the rhinoceros. One carries an axe and other things like water and supplies because they might be out uh, into the bush for a few days. And then the other carries a automatic rifle in case they come into contact with some uh, park rangers so that they can uh, defend themselves. Identifying these people is kind of tricky because you're not looking for large vehicles which are easier to spot. You're trying to look for groups of small uh, numbers and they're very difficult to come by and they oftentimes will hide under the tree canopies. So stealth is an important part of the UAV because then the poachers are not always hiding. They, they might be out in the open and it's easier to spot them with infrared cameras. So the natural reaction of course to any kind of poaching activity is to send uh, boots out on the ground and uh, so these are some of the park rangers that they've got out and uh, of course their numbers are limited they have limited resources so what they really need is a force multiplier if they could be directed in the direction of the poachers and if the drone can provide real-time surveillance and follow the poachers and and get that information down to the boots on the ground it makes interception and interdiction much much easier in the United States of course they use predators and reapers uh, among other aircraft and they're great and uh, they work really well. The problem is for most countries outside the United States is that they don't have access to defense satellites which is what you need to have for communications over long range. So anything over then about oh, 50, 60, 70 miles is extremely difficult to do without using satellite communications. And these Reapers and Predators, their cost uh, between 5 million and 15 million dollars depending on how they're outfitted. And one of the issues with the Predators and Reapers is, of course, they can only be in one place at one time. They can only cover so much distance. You only have one set of eyes in the air at a time. So it would be better, in a lot of instances, to have multiple aircraft in multiple locations rather than a single aircraft that can be spotted from the ground. Many times the terrorists will watch and see when the Predators and Reapers take off, and then they uh, have an idea of when they're operating. This gives them a, then a heads up so that they can take cover. Another capable product is the Air Environment Puma and many other related products similar to it. Now it uses an electric motor and it normally doesn't go out more than about 50-80 miles. The uh, issue with it is of course that it's about 10 times as expensive as the Bat Hawk. So the capabilities are pretty close between the Bat Hawk and the Puma, but the uh, cost being 10 times as much, it's a lot more prudent, at least in Africa, to have more eyes in the sky. So a South African country was contracted, it's called uh, UDS, UAV and Drone Solutions, and they were brought onto the scene to be used as a force multiplier, and they had a few different UAVs at their disposal, but what they did was they purchased a lot of different equipment with the money that was provided to them, and they started to sort out what equipment worked best for them. As you can see in the background, they have a couple Penguin Bs, because they were operating in the bush, they got a launcher, which is that black apparatus on the right. 
these are gas engines. They can fly up to 10 hours. They can fly up to uh, 100 miles away pretty easily. And with satellite communications and other technologies, they can be flown from around the world. They also tried a lower cost gas engine fixed wing and they tried a few different models of the electric fixed wings as well as a gas helicopter and then some electric multirotors. So they did quite a bit of research before they went forward. So the telemetry of the aircraft, where it is and what its vitals are, and they have real-time video coming back. They either did routine patrols and just simply looked for people, generally in the evenings, or they might be sent out to a certain location if located a potential threat. And using their stealth capabilities, they were able to get out to the location and identify where the animal is and then identify where the poachers are as well. Unfortunately, the response time is fairly long and it doesn't work that well. Might be locating something hundreds of miles away, and their range is only about 20 miles. So they would have to drive out to a suitable location, usually about 20 miles away, do a quick check of the area using a smaller UAV, usually a multi rotor, to see if there's any poachers or lions or hyenas or any other threats in the area. Then they'd have to set up their system and deploy the UAV, then fly out to station. So that takes quite a while to do. However, the poachers usually shoot the animal and then they go into hiding for a while knowing that a copter will be coming out soon to look for them. So oftentimes they do have time to deploy and get out and actually do some good. After some time they settled on this particular bird called the bat hawk for doing their long range reconnaissance. The advantages of it is that it's very tough. They've been using the same airframe for about a year and a half. They bought several airframes and expected to use them quite often and exchange them every few weeks because they're landing in very harsh environments. But so far, it's been very, very reliable, very rugged, and uh, haven't had any problems with it. Typically, it's operated in a range of about 20 miles away from the home base station. And it's been so successful that they've gone now from one group with one of those vans to four. Virtually everywhere that they've operated, they've been able to completely eliminate the poaching. The poachers do not come in because they know the consequences of being caught. This and other aircraft just like it have had thousands of hours out in the African bush and have been operating for going on two years now. And now this low-cost technology is being made available on the commercial market. Due to the high cost of the ball gimbals that were on the market, UDS decided that they would manufacture their own. So they're using an Alex Moss board for stabilization and they 3D printed some of the parts and they built some molds to make the carbon fiber parts. These ball gimbals then turned out to be very low in weight, very rugged, very durable, and very inexpensive. During daylight operations, they use an EO zoom camera. This one has 10x capability. 10x seems to work pretty well because there is going to be a bit of vibration and a bit of movement, and if you have too much more zoom than that, it really isn't all that effective. So uh, this is a nice inexpensive zoom camera, and that's what they've been using for the past couple of years in Africa. Most of the poaching is done at night, so they use infrared cameras primarily. They use either the 9 hertz or the 30 hertz cameras, and they usually use the, the higher resolution, the 640 cameras. So the latest revision of the Bathawk is the version 2. It has a different fuselage look to it. It's been made out of a composite material to make it lighter and stronger, and it's round and hangs below the wing, so it gives it much more stability, and it's very rugged and easy to operate. It's also very easy to repair if they do have any damage out there in the field, and it's uh, inexpensive to purchase in the beginning. The airframe being a tractor is very efficient and it gets very good range of at least 20 miles and it can get up to about two and a half to three hours of flight time. Of course, we always want to have longer and longer flight endurances so they've been constantly working on improvements in that area. And most of the time they carry either an EO or an IR camera but usually not at the same time. This actually has the capability of carrying both at the same time and you can switch back and forth between the two. 
one key area that the bat hawk's going to be used in is oil theft because there's a lot of illegal pipeline taps there's 17,000 miles of uh, pipeline in mexico alone and they have pipeline taps uh, every a uh, few hundred feet. So terrorists are, are actually taking a lot of the oil out of the pipelines and selling that to subsidize their operations. Because the Bad Hawk has these very long flight characteristics, uh, it can patrol large areas. And because it's silent and very stealthy, then they expect the Bad Hawk to be a big deterrent. Just like in South Africa, where they have caught very, very few poachers using drones, they've completely eliminated the poaching where the drones have operated because the terrorists and the poachers know the consequence of being caught, and they just don't know where the drones are. So they just move on to other activities. In Mexico alone, they lose about 10,000 barrels per day to theft. Here is a view of the underside of the Bat Hawk. As you can see, it has a replaceable skid there on the bottom. That skid has a small slot in it so that it can be bungee launched. Carbon fiber stabilized EOIR camera ball is on the front, and it is a tractor configuration. The large wingspan makes it very stable and very efficient. If you have any more questions about the Bat Hawk, you can go to our website, tbmuas.com. You can give us a call at 941-342-8685. We're located in Sarasota, Florida. It uses an autopilot, which is not export controlled, and the whole airframe is very inexpensive. Please feel free to contact us for more information.